Okay, I think that now you can hear me from Zoom, right? Thanks. I wasn't telling anything relevant, or, or I, I don't know, is the font size okay also for people connected via Zoom? Okay. Yeah, I was asking the same to the audience. This is what I was asking while you weren't hearing anything. Thanks. So uh, before we get started, uh, uh, let me go back to two things that arose uh, yesterday. One was the was a question concerning uh, the index uh, of the term uh, d pi e over d t. As someone pointed out, uh, there was uh, a problem with the indexes that I used, uh, and in fact, uh, the correct expression is the following one. Okay, and then there was another question about why you write the in integrated pressure in this way. So why this factor? here, uh, and this comes from the fact that you can imagine the pressure to be uh, sourced uh, by collisions uh, of particles uh, uh, across a given boundary. So you can think of the pressure as a sort of uh, uh, density of kinetic energy. So let me write it uh, in a classical way, like you can think of the pressure in this way, where you have the number of colliding particles uh, divided by the volume of the box that you are considering, uh, and the pressure along, let's say, an x boundary, so an x plane, will be given by the velocity dispersion of those particles along uh, the x axis. So if you consider that the dispersion is, uh, is isotropic, you can think of the x component as one third of the total uh, velocity of the particles. And then when you move uh, from the classical description to a description uh, that is valid also in, uh, in the rel relativistic limit, uh, then it's very easy to show that uh, uh, this expression here is converted into this expression here that is also valid for uh, massless particles. So you can think, uh, again, as the pressure as a sort of uh, density uh, of uh, um, uh, kinetic energy due to collisions of these particles across these different boundaries. And this is the reason why you have those pi square over three factor uh, in, in the integral. So now let's go back uh, to what we said yesterday. Uh, let me just remind you that at the end, uh, one of the main uh, results that we discussed was uh, the fact that in the perturbed universe, uh, you can think of uh, uh, the main statistics uh, that describe the uh, physical properties of the fields that we are interested in, in terms of the variance of the field, because perturbations uh, are Gaussian, and so the only thing that we care about is the variance uh, of the uh, perturbation field. And this variance uh, can be factored out uh, into two terms, uh, 
one term that is purely stochastic and comes from the initial conditions that are set uh, uh, by your favorite uh, uh, early universe model, for example, inflation, and then a factor that is purely deterministic and is expressed in terms of these transfer functions that describe basically the evolution uh, of the initial conditions that are converted into perturbations into different fields that we observe uh, and evolved uh, until the, uh, the present time. So while this factor here, which is the power spectrum of scalar and tensor uh, perturbations come from predictions of a given inflationary model, uh, this factor here, or these two factors here, if we consider the cross correlation of two different fields, come from the solutions to the coupled set of Boltzmann equations and Einstein equations. In order to obtain these two sets, of equations, both the Boltzmann and the Einstein equations in a perturbed universe, we first have to perturb the matter. So remember that we introduced uh, these four uh, degrees of freedom, two for scalars, which are uh, phi and psi for scalar perturbations, and then we introduced uh, the two degrees of freedom for tensor perturbations to the metric. Once we have uh, the perturbation to the metric, then we can derive the expression uh, of the, for example, the Liouville operator for the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation. And this is what we did uh, at the end yesterday. We derived uh, the expression of the uh, perturbed uh, Liouville operator in case of scalar perturbation. that is given by this expression here. Remember that in the simple case of a homogeneous and isotropic universe, we only have the derivative with respect to time and the derivative with respect to the magnitude of the momentum because there is no dependency on other variables if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Instead, since we are considering a perturbed metric, other terms arise, for example, this term here, which is the derivative, uh, the prefactor of the derivative with respect to coordinates. Then we have this other factor here that comes from the derivative, is the extension of the derivative with respect to momentum. Plus, let me just write it here for short because the full expression is there. We also have, in principle, the derivative with respect to the direction uh, of the momentum. So this is the full expression up to linear order. And we will see that at the end when we'll uh, put also the perturbed version of the distribution function uh, into the Liouville operator, not all of these terms uh, would be necessary for the linear order uh, to, be, to be evolved because in fact we will have uh, a composition of two linear order terms uh, and therefore we can neglect them if we work uh, up to the first order. Uh, so what we need to do now is to derive uh, the same expression in case of tensor perturbations. Then the next step will be to give an expression of the perturbed version of the distribution function. And once we have that, uh, we can write down the full set of Boltzmann and Einstein equations in the case of a perturbed universe uh, in linear order. So let's first start uh, with the uh, tensors. And as we did for scalar perturbations yesterday, we first derive the expression of the four momentum in case of tensor perturbations, and then uh, we derive uh, uh, each 
of the different terms uh, of the UV operator from that expression of the four momentum. So remember that in the case of tensor perturbations, we have the following choice of the metric. So we have the perturbed part of the metric to be like this, where the perturbations are in the transverse and traceless part of the metric uh, that we expressed uh, as H plus plus the polarization times the polarization tensor along the plus direction, let me call it in that way, plus H cross uh, the polarization tensor in this direction, where these two polarization tensors are, for example, in the case of E plus, uh, this is diagonal with uh, one minus one zero, for example, this is one possible choice, and then we have EX, uh, which instead is this one. So when we have to compute the four momentum, uh, by mu, which is again pi zero pi a, we start again from uh, pi zero and we remember that g mu nu pi mu pi nu is in general from the on shell uh, term minus the mass squared. And if we um, expand uh, the summation here, we have again minus pi zero squared plus small pi square, where again the small pi square is g i j pi pi j. So from here, we get pi zero, which is simply E. So in the case of tensor perturbations, for our choice uh, uh, of the perturbations, we have that pi zero is indeed uh, uh, the energy. And to obtain instead the uh, pi E, let me define big, pi, uh, big P I, sorry, <laughs> uh, as proportional where C is a proportionality constant to the direction uh, of, the, of the momentum. Then, remembering again that this is small p square and expanding the summation, remembering who uh, the different terms are, we have A squared, the scale factor, times delta IJ. Here we need to put the full metric, not just the perturbation, times uh, HIJ. And then we have pi, pi J that we can express in this way. And so we have C squared, Pi, pi j. And then from these last two terms, we obtain the value of the proportionality constant, remembering again uh, that the perturbations are small, and so C is simply given by P over A, 1 plus 1 half of uh, H I J pi pi J. And so from this we can write uh, finally that big pi I is P over A the same factor. Uh, 
sorry. Uh, P, let me use these other indices here. H, J, K, Pi, J, Pi, K. Okay, and I'm missing, uh, yes, the direction here. Okay, now we have the four momentum and we can work out all the different terms. For example, we can start from the xi over the t and remember again that if we write this as the xi over the lambda, the lambda over the t, this is simply pi e over pi zero. And so this is pi over a, p over e, h, j, k, pi j, pi k. Okay, then with the same procedure that we did yesterday, we can derive the uh, pi over the t. And remember that, again, we write this as the pi over the lambda, the lambda over the t. And then for pi, we use the expression that we found uh, above. And so for uh, the expression that we obtain for dpi over dt, remember that here we need to use also the geodesic equation, so I will not derive it, uh, it's just some, uh, some algebra, but from the full expression that we obtain for dpi over dt, then we can easily obtain dp over dt, because remember that this is d over dt, and for the magnitude, we can use uh, delta ij pi pi j, and so this will become similarly to what we obtained yesterday for scalar perturbation for the derivative of the magnitude over time, we have again a term that is the usual Hubble friction in a homogeneous and isotropic universe plus a contribution that comes from having perturbed the metric Remember that for scalar perturbation, this was the time derivative of the uh, phi potential. And in the case of tensor perturbation, we have the time derivative, uh, as you might expect, uh, of the tensor perturbation to the metric. And then the last piece is d pi over dt. And again, here we can use that this is uh, the derivative uh, over time uh, of uh, the component pi i over the magnitude. And if you do the algebra, then the result of this calculation gives you zero, which means that tensor perturbations to the metric are not responsible for changing the direction of the momentum. Uh, remember instead that yesterday from, oh, I canceled that, but 
from the fact that this term uh, was not vanishing for scalar perturbations, we obtained uh, uh, the uh, gravitational lensing effect. Because you have gradients uh, of the scalar fields, then you expect a change in the direction of the momentum uh, of, uh, uh, of moving particles uh, in the expanding and perturbed universe. In case of tensor perturbations, instead, this term uh, vanishes. So if we now put uh, all these things together, we obtained the Liouville operator in case of tensor perturbations and the full expression again will be this one. Okay, so we have now the expression of the Liouville operators, both in case of scalar and tensor perturbations. What we need to do now is to write a generic expression of the distribution function, because remember that uh, in the homogeneous and isotropic universe, the distribution function was uh, the equilibrium. We use the expression of the equilibrium distributions, so Fermi-Dirac and Bose-Einstein, where the dependence was just on temperature and magnitude of the momentum. But in this case, uh, we expect that given that the universe is perturbed, uh, the distribution function uh, also take a dependency not only on time and momentum, but also on the coordinate uh, and on the direction of the momentum. But again, we are interested in uh, linear order perturbations, uh, and so we can expand uh, the full distribution function as the sum of two terms, uh, one term that we dubbed F0, which will be the equivalent of the equilibrium distribution in the case of the homogeneous and isotropic universe, times uh, a small perturbation that we will call F1. And so while F0 retain the usual dependency on time and uh, uh, magnitude of the momentum, then F1 in principle will retain the dependency on all the four variables uh, that are listed here. This decomposition is similar to the decomposition that we did for the metric uh, where we wrote uh, the full metric as the sum uh, of the homogeneous and isotropic part time, uh, plus the uh, small perturbation around the homogeneous and isotropic solution. So once we have the perturbed version of the distribution function, it is easy to imagine that we will have also perturbations uh, into the stress energy tensor because you remember from yesterday that we um, linked uh, the microscopic description that is provided by the distribution function with the macroscopic description that we obtain with the stress energy tensor. And so since we have perturbed F, then we will also have uh, a full expression of the stress energy tensor, which also includes these perturbations. So here, for the zero, zero component, uh, we have this time uh, F0 plus F1. Remember that yesterday we wrote this term simply using the distribution function, but this time we have the full expression of the distribution function, so this will become uh, the um, average energy density times uh, a small perturbation around the uh, average energy density. And this, you can simply see this uh, if you expand this summation. So nothing really deep here. Then, 
Remember that yesterday, the US Energy Dance was purely diagonal uh, because we were in presence of a perfect fluid, so we only have the diagonal terms non vanishing. This time, since we have perturbations, we expect both perturbations in the diagonal part, as we already observed here, where the first term is perturbed, but we also have, in principle, non vanishing of diagonal terms, and in fact, we can write the T. 0i term, again, here we have the usual integration. The weight, uh, this time, is the i component of the momentum. And again, we have the sum of uh, f0 plus f1. Then, if you expand the summation, uh, you can convince yourself that the integration over f0 since F0 does not depend uh, on the uh, direction of the momentum uh, and is isotropic, uh, gives you zero. So the integration over the angular part uh, of this uh, um, uh, integration term gives you zero. And so only the F1 uh, uh, integration term survives. Uh, and we expect this because in the uh, homogeneous and isotropic universe, we don't have uh, a non-vanishing T0i component. And finally, we have the perturbed Tij part. And here, now we have, in principle, these weights. And the summation of the two terms gives us two different parts, one which is the perturbed pressure. So remember that along the diagonals we had as the pressure yesterday. This time we expect also a perturbation around the average value of the pressure. And this is the diagonal part. Plus another term that is the perturbation of the off diagonal uh, three-dimensional part uh, of the stress energy tensor. And we can summarize this uh, as this factor sigma ij, where this sigma ij contains the so-called anisotropic stress. Uh, now, let's note uh, uh, one thing, that if we consider uh, non-relativistic particles, so particles for which the the energy is just the rest mass uh, of the particle, which is much larger than the momentum, then this factor here, since contains uh, the ratio between pi square and the energy, will be vanishing. And will be vanishing both uh, along the diagonal, because we expect, uh, for example, in the case of uh, cold dark matter, that the pressure uh, of cold dark matter is, uh, is vanishing. Remember that the equation of state for uh, uh, a non-relativistic particle is uh, uh, this one with the W is almost zero. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around, by the way. Uh, so we expect both the pressure to be uh, vanishing, but we also expect uh, the anisotropic stress part uh, to be vanishing because the same factor, pi square over E, appears uh, in the integral. So this is an important result, uh, the fact that 
uh, non-relativistic uh, uh, collisionless particles have a non-vanishing anisotropic stress component because we will see that this simplifies a lot the hierarchy of the Boltzmann equations for these kind of components. For those kinds of components, we only need uh, to evolve a reduced set of Boltzmann equations because we can cut the number of variables that we need to uh, express uh, the perturbation fields uh, for, those, uh, for those species, taking into account that the anisotropic part uh, is going to zero because the particle is non-relativistic. So now we have uh, the perturbed uh, UV operators, so we have the perturbed distribution function and we have the perturbed stress energy tensor. We can put together all of these ingredients and we can write down what we need to uh, compute the dynamics uh, in this perturbed universe. So the Einstein equations and the uh, full Boltzmann equations. So I won't derive the, the Einstein equations because it will take some time and you can find the derivation uh, of the equations uh, in uh, uh, all the textbooks, including uh, the ones that I uh, told you yesterday. I want just to uh, point out that in the case of uh, Einstein equation, we obtain the two uh, following results. For Scalar perturbations, of course, we expect uh, uh, two uh, equations for the, uh, for the two degrees of freedom uh, for scalar perturbations, and uh, we indeed obtain two equations. The first equation, which you can think of uh, as the general relativistic expression of the Poisson equation. In fact, uh, it has something uh, the expression if you neglect terms uh, that are uh, uh, related to the expanding universe and to uh, general relativity, uh, the, uh, the structure of the first equation is the following, where you have nabla squared of the uh, scalar perturbation connected to the full uh, energy density content of the universe because this raw here is the sum over the energy density of all the species uh, that are in the, uh, in, the evolve, in the evolving universe. The second equation that we obtain instead is telling us the following, that there is a certain relation between the two scalar uh, functions that we use to describe scalar perturbations and the two functions are more or less equal with uh, an opposite sign if, uh, if the anisotropic stress uh, is vanishing. So if in the perturbed evolving universe we have that the stress energy, the anisotropic uh, stress part of the stress energy tensor uh, is vanishing for all the species uh, uh, that we are considering, then we have this equality holding for the two scalar functions. In fact, uh, uh, you, can, uh, um, you can prove that this is not true because we have at least two kind of species for which the anisotropic stress is not vanishing. I told you that this is vanishing for uh, non-relativistic particles, so for example for cold dark matter, but we know that we don't have just non-relativistic species in the universe, uh, but we have photons, for example, which by definition uh, are, uh, non -relativist are um, fully relativistic. And then we also have neutrinos. And neutrinos in the early universe are, uh, at least according to uh, the, the current understanding of the active uh, neutrino families are considered as ultra-relativistic species. So they have a non-vanishing anisotropic stress part. 
So because we have a species for which sigma ij uh, is not vanishing, then this relation doesn't hold at least and as long as the anisotropic part uh, is, uh, is not vanishing. There are some uh, times in the universe where we can relax uh, this, uh, this assumption, but in general, remember that this equality just holds in case of sigma ij totally vanishing. Then for tensor perturbation, if you derive the Einstein equation in case of tensor perturbations, you obtain what you expect in presence of gravitational waves. So you have this equation that describes the evolution of the tensor fluctuations to the metric. This holds for both the tensor degrees of freedom, so H plus and H cross. And this is exactly the evolution equation for uh, uh, the um, um, for gravitational waves, which is corrected with uh, the Hubble friction term. So if, if we are not in an expanding universe, you have the usual uh, uh, second derivative times uh, k square h equal to zero. But since we are in an expanding universe, we have to include uh, the fact that uh, uh, there is an Hubble friction term. Yes. Yeah, sorry, um, um, this is, uh, I, I will use this one to, uh, this term here to um, um, consider derivative with respect to the conformal time. I'm considering that the right hand side, right hand side is zero, but if you derive the full expression of the Einstein equations for tensor perturbations, so this is not fully correct because the right hand side contains uh, again a term that depends on the anisotropic stress part. So there is a feedback uh, on the evolution of gravitational waves that comes from the fact that uh, uh, there are species uh, with a non-vanishing anisotropic stress. And in fact, uh, uh, many uh, codes that evolve uh, the uh, Boltzmann equations uh, uh, in the expanding universe have to take into account uh, uh, a non-vanishing right hand side uh, in this equation in order to obtain accurate predictions uh, for uh, the evolution of cosmological probes. But for our uh, purposes, we can assume that uh, the right hand side is zero. Just remember that uh, in principle, this right hand side here is not vanishing, but it contains terms that depend again on the anisotropic stress part. Now from uh, the metric and the Liouville operator and the distribution function, we can write uh, the collisionless Boltzmann equations. Collisionless means that we will consider the uh, collisional operator on the right hand side of the Boltzmann equation to be vanishing for the moment. Uh, so we can write the collisionless Boltzmann equations for scalar and tensors. And before doing that, let me just change one variable. Since we have seen yesterday from two possible uh, derivations that the momentum scale as the inverse uh, of the scale factor, then it makes sense to consider instead of pi, pi tilde, which is simply a times p, so that if instead of uh, computing, uh, uh, factoring, sorry, the Liouville operator in terms of the derivative with respect to the momentum, uh, we can factor it in terms of the derivative with respect to these pi tilde terms. So we need uh, 
the expression of d pi tilde over dt to be replaced uh, in place of uh, dp over dt, both here in the scalar term and here in the uh, tensor term. And using this variable, it's easy to show that this derivative with respect to time is the scale factor times uh, p times h plus the former derivative uh, with respect to time. So whenever we have uh, dp over dt, we will replace it with uh, dp tilde over dt using uh, this relation here. And then let's switch from uh, time to conformal time. And with these two uh, switches, we can rewrite, and considering also, sorry, that we are uh, at linear order, so we'll retain uh, just first order terms whenever we plug F0 plus F1 into the Liouville operator. We can write the collisionless equation for scalar. So here we have the F1 over the eta times I will now also move to Fourier space. So every time we have a derivative with respect to the coordinate, we replace it with I times the Fourier, uh, the Fourier mode. So here from The scalar part, we have this first term times the second term. So ek that comes in place of the derivative with respect to the coordinate scalar product with the direction of the momentum. And then we have p tilde over e and we can neglect uh, these terms uh, phi plus psi because they will be multiplying uh, the derivative of the first order um, expansion of the distribution function. We don't have uh, the derivative of the zero order distribution function because the, the zero order does not depend on the coordinates. And so here we simply have uh, F1 minus the same we can do here. So we will have F prime plus E, E, K, colored P psi and here we have the derivative of the zero order term. In fact, if we were considering here the derivative of the first order term, this will multiply always uh, uh, factors that are first order. So we'll neglect that and the only contribution that we'll retain uh, in case of the derivative with respect to the momentum is the zero order term of the distribution function. And finally, we would in principle have the derivative with respect to the direction, but remember that this term only contained first order contribution. This prefactor here contains first order contribution. So we should have just the zero order distribution function here, but again, 
the zero order distribution function does not depend on the direction of the momentum and therefore uh, at first order we don't have uh, this contribution to the Liouville operator in case of scalar perturbations. And so this will be, sorry this is a tilde, this will be the collisionless uh, Boltzmann equation uh, in case of scalar perturbations. Then we can repeat the same for tensor perturbations. So this is scalar. Now let's do tensors. So we have the usual term here, plus again for tensor perturbations we again have a derivative with respect to coordinates, so we take out uh, EK scalar P, P tilde over E, and again just F1 for the same reasons uh, why we had just F1 in the case of scalar perturbations. Then we have the equivalent uh, here uh, the, um, that we had for scalar perturbations, also for tensor perturbations. So we expect uh, for tensor perturbations here to appear a term that contains the derivative with respect to conformal time of the perturbations to the metric. And indeed, we have minus one half h prime jk pi j pi k, pi tilde, and again here we just have the derivative with respect to pi tilde of the zero order term of the distribution function for the very same reason because we are just retaining uh, first order terms. So this will be the equivalent of the Boltzmann equation for tensor perturbations. And let me write uh, the term that contains the metric uh, using uh, the usual summation over the two degrees of freedom or spin of uh, uh, metric perturbations. So this will be H prime S, the amplitude of the two uh, degrees of freedom times the polarization tensor. Pi k, pi j. Okay. So what we will do now before uh, having a break uh, is to expand that summation and prove that because we have uh, uh, tensor perturbations, uh, uh, we also have a dependency on uh, uh, the angular uh, coordinates uh, in case of uh, tensor perturbations. So this dependency does not arise uh, in case of scalar perturbations, but tensor perturbations induce a dependency on the theta phi uh, angles and we will see why in one second by expanding that summation there. In fact, let's use the uh, following coordinate system. We will consider a spherical coordinate system. Uh, we will consider uh, in this coordinate system uh, to be aligned uh, along the uh, k direction, the direction of the, uh, of the Fourier mode. And then we will also have that pi e is written in this way, so sin theta cos phi, sin theta pi and cos theta. 
Then we have again that with the choice of our coordinate system, A plus uh, is diagonal, one minus one, zero, and A cross uh, is what I told you before, so this symmetric uh, tensor here. So when you compute the product uh, uh, in each of the terms uh, in the summation uh, uh, over the tensor degrees of freedom uh, of the uh, pi k, pi j component uh, and uh, E plus uh, E cross polarization tensor, uh, you can see that the only terms uh, that survive in that summation are A plus uh, one one, times uh, pi one squared plus uh, a plus two two pi two squared. So this is for uh, s equal to plus. And in the case of cross, uh, then the only terms that survive uh, are these of diagonal terms, and so we will have uh, A cross uh, one two, pi one, pi two, and then the symmetric term, so A cross two one, pi two, pi one. So the sum over the uh, tensor spins uh, or tensors degrees of freedom becomes the following. So we have sum over S, H prime S, H S, J K, pi J, pi K. So we have the term with plus, which has the derivative of H plus, and then the product of the polarization tensor times the component of the direction of pi, and this will single out sine square theta, cos square phi, minus sine square theta, sin square phi. Then we have the other degrees of freedom, and so we have the derivative of H cross, and in this case, the product of the polarization tensor times the component of the direction is simply given by two sin square theta cos phi sin phi. So we can simplify these factors uh, using trigonometrics. This first, these factors here becomes, uh, if we take out uh, sin square theta, then we have cos square phi minus sin square phi, and this is simply cosine of two phi. And then, surprise, surprise, here we have sin square theta sine of two phi. Uh, so let me move here. Now we just take all the terms together and we write uh, the dependency that arises from the tensor perturbations to the metric uh, in terms of uh, theta phi angles, uh, the angles of our spherical 
coordinate system. And so at the end, the sum can be simply written as uh, sin square theta, which multiplies uh, h prime plus uh, cos to phi plus h prime cross uh, sin to phi. Now let me use this notation. Let me call theta Uh, no, let me call cos theta, which is in our coordinate system, the angle between the direction of the momentum and the direction of the Fourier mode. Let me call it mu. And so with this definition, the summation become, becomes one minus mu square. And let me use this sloppy notation. I will now go back to the summation over the degrees of freedom. Then here I have again the derivative with respect to conformal time of the metric. And here, instead of uh, writing explicitly the dependence in terms of uh, trigonometric function, I will use uh, the exponential notation. So this is the expression for the uh, prefactor in the Liouville, the prefactor of the df0 over dp tilde of the Liouville operator that we will use uh, whenever we will consider uh, the uh, Liouville operator in, in case of tensor perturbations. And here we have proved uh, that tensor perturbations to the metric uh, introduces this dependency uh, in the Liouville operator, a dependency on the angle uh, theta, and more importantly, a dependency on the azimuthal angle phi. And this comes from the very nature of uh, uh, the kind of modifications to the metric that gravitational waves uh, induces. Remember that Leonardo explained also yesterday, you have that gravitational waves stretches uh, the metrics uh, uh, along uh, uh, plus direction with an elongation <laughs> along the, let's call it y axis and x axis, and this would be the uh, plus term of the polarization tensor. And then we also have stretches along uh, the uh, 45 degrees uh, direction in this coordinate system, and this will be the E cross component. Uh, uh, of the degrees of freedom uh, on which we have expanded our tensor perturbations. So because we have this composition of stretches to the metric, uh, we do expect, uh, and in fact we find, uh, a dependency on the azimuthal angle phi. So now, uh, let just stay with me for another couple minutes before we go uh, to the break. Uh, it, in principle, uh, once we also write down the collision term uh, for the Boltzmann equation, we have the two uh, main equations uh, coupled with the Einstein equations that we need to evolve uh, the, uh, the perturbation fields uh, uh, in the expanding universe. So in order to have the solutions for the transfer functions that we need when we want to compute the variance of the perturbation fields. However, it is much more uh, simple to take out the dependency on, uh, on the angular coordinates. And so instead of solving the full Boltzmann equations as we have written them down uh, in, uh, uh, on the blackboard with the collision term, it is much more easy to expand uh, the angular dependency uh, in, um, in harmonics. So in other words, uh, we will do something that in principle seems uh, a bit more contrived than just solving uh, two sets uh, of Boltzmann equations. Uh, we will expand uh, 
the one equation or the two equations that we have, one for scalar and one for tensors, into an infinite uh, um, set uh, of, uh, of Boltzmann equations where uh, each uh, of the equation uh, in this um, infinite hierarchy uh, set uh, correspond to a different projection in, um, in harmonics. So let's call the X perturbation field. When we say that we'll expand the perturbation field, we say the following. We expand it into an infinite sum over L. With L, we consider uh, as the usual harmonics uh, the L harmonic. Then we have the uh, coefficient of the expansion which takes some normalization factors that depend on the L harmonic. We have the expansion coefficient of the field XL. And then the basis that we use to expand the perturbation field is represented by the Legendre polynomial, which takes the mu variable, remember that mu is the cosine of the theta angle, so it's the scalar product uh, of the Fourier mode uh, and the direction of the momentum. And with this decomposition, once we have uh, first uh, integrated the Boltzmann equation uh, appropriately over momentum, uh, so to uh, convert the distribution function into macroscopic quantities, uh, expanding those macroscopic quantities into Legendre polynomial and so taking out uh, the expansion coefficient, one for each of the infinite uh, um, components uh, uh, of the harmonic expansion, then we can write down an infinite series uh, of Boltzmann equations uh, for, uh, um, for the different uh, uh, perturbation fields. Uh, these are simpler to solve because if we expand uh, the angular uh, dependency, then in principle we don't have to take care of that angular dependency when we solve each of the different lines uh, of the series of Boltzmann equations. Uh, this is useful also because, as I told you before, uh, in case of massless species, uh, this infinite series is not infinite at all because we can retain just the first two equations. Uh, in case of uh, uh, non-relativistic particles, uh, the L equals zero, which is the so-called monopole, which is basically the energy density uh, for, the, uh, for the species, and the L equal to one component, uh, which is the dipole, and in the case of non-relativistic particles, uh, is the uh, velocity perturbation uh, of the field. In case of uh, fully relativistic species, instead, uh, we have an infinite series uh, of, uh, of equations. In principle, we cannot cut uh, the, uh, the hierarchy because we have seen that the anisotropic stress is non-vanishing and in principle, all the other uh, terms uh, with uh, L equal to three, four, and so on and so forth until infinite must be retained uh, in, uh, in this case. However, uh, in the next lectures, uh, we will show that, uh, for example, for photons, uh, we indeed only care about the first multiples, let's say up to L equal four. Uh, I hope that we will have time to show that. Uh, because uh, at the end, uh, we can solve uh, the Boltzmann equation in a very uh, smart way uh, that will prove that the only terms uh, that are responsible for the physical properties of the photon fluctuations uh, are just the very few multiples uh, from L equal zero to L equal four. Uh, and all the other multiples from uh, L greater than four uh, can be just obtained uh, very trivially from the solutions to uh, L equal zero to L equal four. Uh, so for this reason, uh, this kind of expansion uh, is uh, uh, is very useful uh, for solving the, the hierarchy of the Boltzmann equations. Uh, before going to the post, just one uh, sec. I told you that 
For non-relativistic particles, uh, uh, you first expand uh, uh, the Boltzmann equation and then take just the first two moments uh, of the expansion uh, for evolving the full set of perturbations uh, in that case. Uh, there is also an alternative route that you can use to derive uh, the Boltzmann equations for uh, non-relativistic particles. And that route is similar to the one that is used uh, in the homogeneous and isotropic universe uh, when you have to derive the continuity equation uh, in, in Remember that uh, we obtain the continuity equation from uh, the conservation of the um, stress energy tensor. And the same can be done in the case of the perturbed universe. So we take uh, the full expression of the stress energy tensor, so the one that contained uh, the perturbations uh, in all the components of the stress energy tensor. Uh, we apply uh, conservation of the stress energy tensor and uh, from the conservation of the stress energy tensor, because uh, the perturbed stress energy tensor contains more uh, than one uh, independent component, then we derive two sets of equations, which corresponds to the two multiples uh, that we need uh, to evolve the uh, Boltzmann equations for non-relativistic particles. So these two routes are completely uh, alternative uh, and of course they will give you the, the same result uh, if, uh, if taken. So now let's have uh, 10 minutes uh, break uh, and we will reconvene uh, at uh, 10.15 more or less. Okay, sorry for being late. Uh, for those connected via Zoom, sorry for being late. Okay, let's get back to our equations. So now we'll start with the CMB part. So we have observed, uh, now it's a decade, decade long observation of fluctuations in the CMB field, both in temperature and polarization. This is a, another great success of the standard cosmological model because we both predict uh, uh, the features uh, in CMB fluctuations uh, in temperature and polarization. We predict uh, that CMB must be polarized uh, because of Thomson scattering uh, uh, of free electrons. And we indeed uh, observed uh, this pattern uh, uh, first in temperature, because it's much brighter than polarization, so it was easier <laughs> to, to observe it, uh, even if uh, uh, it, it has been a great challenge uh, uh, that was, uh, was solved uh, with great success. So we observed this pattern in temperature, uh, and uh, uh, finally we also observed it uh, uh, in polarization. In case of photons, uh, as in case of... Uh, other uh, components, so we can derive, for example, neutrinos. Uh, we can derive uh, the Boltzmann equations that describe the evolution uh, of this species, uh, again, separating between scalar perturbations and tensor perturbations. Why we have to uh, distinguish between the two? Because we have seen that the Boltzmann equation takes uh, uh, terms uh, that depend on the metric uh, and we can use uh, the fact that uh, in the decomposition theorem tells us that at least at linear order we can treat uh, these two classes uh, of perturbations separately. So this simplifies a lot uh, the solution to the Boltzmann equations. So our scope will be to derive uh, uh, an explicit expression of the Boltzmann equations for photons uh, in case of scalar and uh, tensor perturbations. But before doing that, uh, let me just give you a pictoric um, picture <laughs> uh, of uh, what we are going to do. So we know that 
CMB is polarized. It's polarized because of Thomson scattering. Uh, it gets polarized uh, around the time uh, at which uh, um, free electrons uh, were uh, available and scattering uh, were efficient. So this is a very tiny window uh, in the early universe uh, around the so-called uh, recombination uh, epoch. Uh, why is this so tiny? Because we will see that the source uh, term of the intensity field. So is the L equal to expansion coefficient uh, of, the, um, of the CMB uh, perturbation field. But in the early universe, uh, because of a very efficient uh, uh, scattering between photons uh, and electrons, uh, the, uh, the photon perturbation field can be treated together with uh, electrons uh, as a perfect fluid. And so at that time, uh, we only need, uh, uh, as we need, for example, for matter component, uh, uh, only the first two multiples of the expansion, uh, uh, of the expansion hierarchy. We only needed the L equal zero, the monopole, which is the total uh, intensity of the um, uh, perturbation field. Uh, or the energy density, and L equal to which is the dipole uh, of the perturbation field, or the, veloci the velocity dispersion, let's say. So at early times, uh, the hierarchy also for photons uh, was cut to L equal zero and L equal one. So there was no uh, non-vanishing L equal two arising because of the very efficient Thomson scattering. Then as the universe expanded, uh, the uh, rule of the thumb condition that we saw yesterday started to, uh, to play a role. So we had that the interaction rate of Thomson scattering became comparable to the expansion rate and so this scattering were not uh, so efficient as they, as they were uh, in the early universe. And so we started to develop uh, a non-vanishing uh, anisotropic stress uh, with power transferred from the first multiples, uh, L equal zero to L equal one, to the higher multiples of the hierarchy. You can think of this uh, of power because the interactions between the photons uh, uh, and free electrons were not so efficient as, uh, as they were uh, in the past. However, uh, in order to have scattering, uh, and so in order to have uh, polarization arising uh, in the CMB field, uh, apart from a non-vanishing uh, quadrupolar moment, uh, we also need free electrons because we still have to scatter off uh, free electrons in order to polarize uh, the radiation field. The problem is that very close to the decoupling epoch uh, between photons and electrons, uh, there is the um, recombination epoch. So at around that time, free electrons started to recombine uh, with protons to form a neutral, neutral hydrogen. So you can easily see uh, from this pictorial view uh, that uh, uh, at the same time uh, that a quadrupolar pattern uh, was arising uh, and so that polarization was possible to be uh, developed uh, in the radiation field, uh, the target uh, particles, the free electrons, uh, started to be depleted uh, because of recombination with protons uh, into uh, neutral hydrogen. So there is a very tiny window uh, in, during which uh, polarization can be sourced. Uh, and this is the reason why the intensity of the polarization field, uh, so the amplitude of the polarization signal, uh, were at least an order of magnitude lower uh, than the amplitude of the temperature field. This makes uh, uh, extremely challenging to observe uh, uh, the, polarization, the polarization field, but nevertheless, uh, we have plenty of observations uh, uh, of a specific uh, uh, polarization pattern in the CMB, which grow our confidence uh, in, uh, in our understanding uh, uh, of the fundamental physics that governs uh, the evolution of the CMB field uh, in the early universe. So let me just now convince you uh, of the fact that we need a quadrupolar pattern uh, to develop a polarization field, and I will do this uh, uh, 
again, pictorially, you can prove that uh, writing down uh, the expression of the intensities uh, of the polarization field uh, using uh, uh, the usual scattering amplitude, but I will do that pictorically just to simplify uh, our understanding. So let's consider this coordinate system. We have x along this direction, then we have y along this direction, and z along this direction. Then let's consider a wave unpolarized, so to represent an unpolarized wave, wave I will draw this cross with the arms of the same length that is moving along the x-axis -axis and going towards the origin of the reference system. Then we can consider also another wave that is moving along the y-axis and is again unpolarized and is moving towards the origin. So in this view, I'm representing an isotropic uh, CMB field with radiation that is unpolarized and is scattering towards uh, the origin. So when these waves uh, scatter uh, with some free electron that is at the origin, then they move along the z-axis and only the polarization arm that is perpendicular both to the incoming axis and the outgoing axis remains. So from the wave that is coming uh, along the x direction, uh, we only retain uh, this arm. And from the wave that is coming along the y direction, then we only retain this arm here. And again, because the length of the, arm, uh, of the arms was the same, then also the outgoing field is unpolarized. You can then repeat this argument for all the different combination of directions, and because the radiation is totally unpolarized, we do not expect any polarized radiation uh, to, uh, to be generated. So this, this is telling us that in the case of isotropic radiation, we don't have polarization. Now let's move uh, to another possibility. We still have uh, the same uh, reference system. And in this case, we consider a dipolar pattern for the scattering field. So we have some radiation that is coming again along the x-axis. And in this case, uh, this radiation has some shorter arms uh, uh, than average, which means that this radiation pattern here is colder than average, uh, moving along the x uh, uh, direction. Then from the opposite direction, still the x direction, moving towards the origin, we have another wave that is coming that is hotter than average, because we want to consider this time a dipolar pattern. So when these two waves scatter at the origin and uh, the arms uh, are transferred uh, to the x-axis, uh, then here we have to average over the two waves uh, that are coming. So again, we have uh, uh, one arm uh, that is, uh, uh, that is propagating, uh, that is, uh, uh, again, of average uh, intensity. So we have this arm here, but then we have to consider all the possible dipolar pattern uh, that are arising from all the directions uh, uh, that, mm, uh, that comes towards the origin. So for example, we will have uh, some colder radiation that is coming uh, along the x-axis, uh, which scatter with some other radiation that is coming again from the opposite direction, and this will transfer uh, again an arm which will be of average length 
because they must be averaged together. So again, this proves, uh, at least pictorially, that a dipolar pattern cannot source uh, a polarization field uh, when we consider all the possible incoming uh, uh, direction. So when we average over the full uh, solid angle of the possible uh, radiation fields uh, that are scattering at the origin. Then we are finally left with the quadrupolar pattern. So we consider the same coordinate system. This time uh, consider a quadrupolar pattern, which means that we have some colder than average radiation that is moving along the x-axis from both directions going towards the origin. Then along the y-axis, instead, we have some hotter than average radiation that is moving towards the origin. And this time, uh, when we uh, maintain, when we retain uh, just the correct uh, arm uh, that is propagating along the z-axis uh, for the two uh, directions uh, uh, that we are considering, then we can see that in one case, we just transfer a colder than average arm. And in the other case, uh, we transfer and hotter than average arm. This kind of pattern cannot be averaged if we consider the average over the full solid angle, because we cannot have uh, other incoming directions that can cancel out uh, uh, the polarization field that is arising from this quadrupolar pattern here. So this is a pictorial proof Again, you can do the calculation uh, with the scattering amplitudes uh, that the quadrupole, which is the L equal to expansion term of our infinite series of uh, uh, Legendre uh, polynomial that we use to expand the polarization field, is the source of linear polarization. in the CMB field. So we really need to have a non-vanishing L equal to uh, moment expansion of the CMB field in order to source uh, polarization. So what are the tools that we need to describe the polarized CMB field. We usually use uh, or uh, take uh, some notation from uh, optics. So we use the Stokes parameters to describe a polarized field and also to describe the CMB field. So we will consider Stokes parameters. And these Stokes parameters are T, which is given by the average of the intensity along the x direction. So once we have defined a reference system, T is defined as the average uh, of the intensity of the radiation field along the x-axis plus the average along the uh, y-axis. So this, is, this represents the total intensity. Then we have the Q Stokes parameter that is defined similarly to T, but this time we have the difference between uh, 
the intensity along the two axes. So Q measures linear polarization along the X and Y axis. So we see that a fully polarized radiation along the X axis will have Q equal to one because this one Y will be zero. Whereas a fully polarized radiation which is polarized along the Y axis will have Q equal to minus one. So you can think of the Q parameter also as the intensity or number of photons, if you want, along x, y direction. Then we have another parameter that can be used to describe linear polarization, which is u. And u is defined as two times the real part of the product between the component along x and the component along y. And u represents the linear polarization along a direction that has at 45 degree angle with respect to the x-axis. So if we have here our reference system, q and u will represent the intensity along x and y, while u will represent the intensity along these two directions here that are at 45 degrees with respect to uh, the x-axis. And finally, we have another parameter, V, which is defined as the imaginary part of the product. And V is used to quantify the degree of circular polarization uh, of, uh, of the light. In the standard cosmological model, we have that Thomson scattering generates linear polarization, but is unable to generate circular polarization. And we don't have, uh, at least in the standard cosmological model, we don't have uh, interactions that can generate uh, a circular polarization in the CMB. So we expect this V parameter to be vanishingly small or zero uh, at all. Uh, there are different models beyond the standard model that can predict uh, some degree of circular polarizations, but we will not consider them in these lectures. So uh, for the remainder of, uh, of these lectures, we will consider V to be equal to zero, and so we will not consider it uh, uh, at all. The Stokes parameters can be used to define the so-called polarization tensor. which is a two by two tensor whose entries uh, are simply combinations uh, of the Stokes parameters. And we can also normalize uh, this polarization tensor to be proportional to the fractional variation uh, of the CMB intensity. So let me write uh, the polarization tensor PAB with AB representing uh, the different entries. So this is one half. The first entry is t, t plus q. The second entry is minus u. Let me just write it with the, with the v component as well. Then we will consider v to be equal to zero. Then here we have minus uh, u plus <laughs> iv. And the final entry is T minus Q. So now taking V to be equal to zero, we can already see the relation between the polarization tensor and the Stokes parameters because T will be given by the trace of the polarization tensor. If we take the sum of the diagonal entries, uh, this will give us the T component. Then Q will be simply the difference between uh, the diagonal components. And finally, U will be 
when v is equal to zero minus two times the off diagonal, one of the two off diagonal components, because at that point uh, the, the tensor would be symmetric. And remember that we would like PAB to be normalized in such a way that it is proportional to the fractional variation of the intensity of the field. Now, this is important because we can, uh, uh, for photons, uh, we can demonstrate that if we take uh, the distribution function written in terms uh, of uh, F0 plus uh, F1, uh, and uh, F1 uh, can be considered uh, as a sort of expansion coefficient uh, in Taylor expansion uh, around uh, the distribution function, uh, then this becomes uh, simply over dp, and here we have uh, the delta, let me call it, uh, uh, let's see what we can use. Delta T. So this will be the perturbation of the uh, temperature or intensity field of the CMB. And uh, this expansion is useful because uh, at the end we will connect uh, this expansion coefficient here, which is related uh, uh, to the um, intensity, to the perturbations uh, of the intensity of the CMB field uh, to the components uh, of the um, polarization tensor. So this normalization is very useful because will allow us, uh, once we obtain uh, uh, a set of equations uh, for the Stokes parameters and therefore for the components of the polarization tensor directly to the perturbations uh, of the CMB field uh, by means of this expansion uh, of the distribution function for photons. Okay, let me, before ending the lecture, sorry if I take uh, a few more minutes uh, to your break, uh, let me just introduce uh, the spin-weighted uh, uh, harmonics because from the Stokes parameters, we have that two of them, if we consider uh, also V, two of these parameters are scalar quantities, uh, T and V. So the total intensity of the CMB field and uh, the degree of circular polarization are, are scalar quantities. Actually, T is a proper scalar, whereas you can prove that V is a pseudo-scalar. So it changes sign uh, uh, with, um, with parity transformation. But Q and U uh, doesn't have uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same property because they transform uh, under rotation uh, of the reference system, they transform uh, in the following way. So let's consider Q prime, which is the uh, Q parameter that is measured uh, in a rotated reference system. So you can already uh, by remembering the definition of Q and U, uh, you can already uh, grasp the sense of why Q and U are not scalar, uh, because they need a reference system to be defined, because they are the degree of polarization along X, Y, and 45 degree direction. So if I rotate the reference system uh, along the new X, Y, and 45 direction, I will have a different value of Q and U parameters. And the way they are related to the old parameters is the following. We have the new Q, which is simply the rotation of the old Q and U. Sorry, this is too phi. And U prime, which as you can imagine, is the following. 
So phi is the rotation of the reference system and uh, the new <coughs> Q and U in the new reference system are related uh, to the old uh, Q and U in the following way. These expressions are important because from these expressions uh, we can build uh, two quantities uh, which have a, definitive, uh, a definite spin. Uh, why this is important? Because we are interested in uh, expansion uh, of these perturbation fields uh, on the sphere. Remember that we already used uh, the expansion, uh, the angular ex expansion of the perturbation field in Legendre polynomial. In general, the CMB field is defined on a sphere, uh, and so we would like to expand uh, uh, the different quantities that we use to describe the polarization field uh, uh, on this sphere. But in order to do that, we have to identify some combinations uh, of the um, quantities uh, of the Stokes parameters in particular that have uh, a definite behavior, a specific behavior uh, on this sphere, and in particular uh, under rotations uh, uh, on the sphere. Uh, these quantities uh, are so-called uh, spin uh, um, definite quantities. So T is a, definite, uh, is a spin definite quantity because it is a scalar, so it has spin equal to zero. Q and U doesn't have uh, a definite spin uh, because they don't respect the property of uh, properly spin uh, uh, definite quantities. Uh, a spin definite quantity F small s theta phi, I will just tell you this and then stop the lecture here, uh, as uh, a given uh, S spin if under rotation of the reference system on uh, the tangential plane uh, on the sphere, so we have uh, a coordinate, a spherical coordinate system with the radial component and then uh, another, uh, the, the other two components of the reference system are defined on the plane that is tangential to the sphere. If we rotate this tangential uh, coordinate system, then a spin defined quantity uh, behave under rotation in the following way. If we define prime as the rotated uh, spin weighted function, then uh, this can be expressed uh, in terms of the old quantity as uh, e to the minus uh, is uh, alpha if uh, alpha is the rotation of the tangential plane times uh, the old quantity. So a function is, is said to have a S spin if it behaves uh, in the following way under rotation of the tangential plane. So T, the, the total intensity as uh, S equal to zero because it is a scalar. So if we rotate the tangential plane, it doesn't have any effect on T because it is a scalar. So S is equal to zero. Q and U alone doesn't have this property but we can build uh, two combinations uh, of Q and U, in particular Q plus uh, IU and Q minus uh, IU. <laughs> you can simply see this by combining these two equations. And this will have uh, now a definite spin because if I rotate the tangential plane uh, of alpha, then the w this will transform uh, as uh, e to the minus or plus uh, two e alpha old uh, q plus uh, i u. So these two combination q plus i u and q minus i u are the new spin defined quantities that we will need uh, for describing the CMB field uh, and they have uh, spin to uh, weight. So the three quantities that we will use will be T, which is a scalar quantity, so S equal to zero, and Q plus minus uh, IU, which has spin equal to uh, minus two for Q plus uh, IU, and spin 
plus 2 for q minus i u. Okay, I believe that I have office hour this afternoon, but you are welcome to stop by my office or ask me questions uh, whenever you want. And I think that you will also have uh, exercises uh, this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you to those on Zoom. And on Zoom, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take your questions uh, either directly or if you want to drop me an email, uh, we can also organize a, a quick Zoom in the, after, in the afternoon if you want. So let me know, I'm available also for you for questions. Cheers. <laughs>